Hello, a warm welcome to our Kojic podcast series. My name is Anthony Richards and I'm the editorial director of Kojic. The intention of this podcast series is to discuss particular themes of contemporary relevance within terrorism and counter-terrorism. And today's themes revolve around UK counter-terrorism and UK counter-extremism. Um, I'm delighted today to be joined by Richard Walton. He is a director of Counterterrorism Global Limited, a company that assists governments, private corporations, and NGOs in designing and implementing solutions for countering terrorism and extremism. He is a former commander at New Scotland Yard, and he was head of the Metropolitan Police Counterterrorism Command from 2011 to 2016. And indeed, he spent the majority of his 30 year policing career in the counterterrorism field. Richard, a warm welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, nice to be here. Uh, Richard, um, I, I guess my first question uh, relates to the chapter that you kindly contributed to our volume, Jihadist Terror. Um, and in that cha chapter, you suggested that while the UK has one of the most respected counterterrorism strategies of any country in the world, I think you suggested, um, it has a less developed counter extremism strategy. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little further on that. Uh, well, thank you. Yes, I mean, we do have an underdeveloped counter extremism strategy, but um, that's pretty much replicated around the world. There are very few countries actually who are um, getting grips to grips with uh, counter extremism um, as a particular strategy. I think as a nation, we can't quite um, decide how we tackle the clear nexus between extremism and terrorism and where the line is between freedom of speech and encouraging or inciting terrorist acts. That's the nexus that everybody's struggling with. Um, and I think personally, I think as a nation, we tend to be quite tolerant of extremist narratives, um, you know, because we are a tolerant nation. Our current uh, counter extremism strategy is now five years old and, and rather dated. It was uh, brought into being by David Cameron in 2015. Um, and the government, the current government, have promised a revised um, CE strategy and um, they, they very much need to deliver one, I believe, um, quite soon. Um, so I think they need to be bold and spell out that some extremists are using free speech to radicalize uh, the young and particularly and within some parts of the Muslim community in particular. Um, the new strategy needs to propose new legislation to close this, this loop, this loophole, um, that allows extremists to incite and encourage violence both here and overseas. So what I'm saying is that freedom of speech um, should not be so sacrosanct, I guess, um, that people can glorify acts of terrorist violence um, with impunity. It's a very difficult grey area, um, but one that we need to grip, I think, and grip soon. Thank you, Richard. That's, that's really interesting. I, I, I mean, absolutely, um, we would classify extremism as those that would condone the use of violence um, and terrorist violence. Um, what about actually in relation to that, um, some sort of uh, support, peaceful support for, say, a caliphate or some elements of Sharia law in this country? Um, what should be within the focus of a counter, counter extremism strategy at the same time as preserving this sort of democratic right, if you like, to, to freely express yourself? Well, what I'm saying is it's not completely, um, there, there are bounds to this. And I, th I think we need to draw some lines. Um, and um, we've tended, I think, to be uh, too tolerant to allow all freedom of speech regardless of people actually proffering uh, ideologies and theologies that actually are completely against our values and against um, the, uh, the things we stand for and the democratic values, for instance. And that was what the original 2015 counter extremism strategy was trying to do. Um, but I think what we didn't do was we didn't put in place um, operational and legislative measures that actually can close that gap. So it can say what is actually uh, not to be tolerated and what is tolerated because we have a small band of um, organizations and groups quite well organized um, who use um, you know quite expensive lawyers at times too um, who are actually very sympathetic to some of these um, extremist narratives whether they be the far right or whether they be Islamist or, or indeed other uh, extremist narratives and who can at the moment basically put these 
narratives into to young people predominantly, but you know, to radicalize and and kind of get away with it without because they're using freedom of speech. And it, we need to draw the lines, I think, and, and that's what the new CE strategy needs to do. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, in, in relation to um, uh, developing a counter-terrorism or counter, sorry, counter-extremism um, strategy within the UK, um, to what extent do you think the Commission for Countering Extremism has made a positive contribution towards such a strategy since its formation in 2018? So I have a slightly uh, mixed view on what has been achieved by the Commission so far. Let me start with the positives. I think um, it has consulted widely across the country, um, but very comprehensively, and reported on what it found. Um, it produced uh, an excellent report uh, recently called Operating with Impunity, and, um, and actually redefined extremism as hateful extremism. Now, um, I don't like the term hateful extremism because a lot of extremism is actually driven not necessarily by hate per se, but by an ideology, or in the case of Islamist terrorism, a theology. Uh, and so, but that said, the new definition of hateful extremism uh, needs to be carefully considered by Parliament because I think it had some merit. Um, and the report did highlight that extremists are circumventing existing laws, as I said earlier, openly glorifying terrorism, you know, collecting and sharing some of the most violent extremism propaganda. Um, or intentionally stirring up racial or religious hatred against others. And it actually recommended, I think, three, three main recommendations, creating a legal and operational framework to counter um, the hateful extremism threats, uh, expanding current offences relating to stirring up hatred, and elevating hateful extremism to be a priority alongside terrorism. And I, and I support those, those recommendations. If I was being critical, though, um, of the achievements of the Commission, I'd say that it has has slightly less impact than it should have done because I think it's inadvertently presented different forms of extremism as equivalent in the UK, um, particularly presenting the threat from extremist far right groups as, as equal or equivalent to the threat from Islamist extremism. Um, now, in order to address extremism head on, in my view, you actually have to describe it accurately. And the most serious threat of terrorism and extremism in the UK currently remains the threat from Islamist ideologies by some margin, um, probably nine, nine tenths of the threat in, within the UK um, extremist threat comes from is, Islamist ideologies. Now, when I started in counterterrorism in um, the late um, 80s, um, Islamist extremism didn't even exist. Um, you know, 95%, uh, if not 98% of all the endeavor uh, by the police uh, counterterrorism officers was, was targeted against um, then Irish terrorism. And I think we had a desk of only three or four people dealing with Islamist terrorism. So terrorism changes and morphs um, uh, over time. But currently um, we have a, a very serious Islamist um, uh, threat, extremist threat, both within the UK and also wider afield you know, globally. And I think to sort of present it as, as equivalent to the threat of the right wing for instance, is, 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 is not a transparent way of, of actually uh, explaining the current threat we're facing. And I think we, the Commission should have been a little bit more upfront about that. But we'll see, we'll see how that goes, uh, goes on from now um, in the years to come. Thanks, Richard. Good, good, on that issue, I mean, why do you think that has happened? How, why has that developed? Well, I think when the Commission was set up, um, uh, understandably, um, uh, some of those organisations who I would describe as extremists were were opposed to the creation of the commission, and uh, uh, you know there was lots of um, uh, narrative on social media and elsewhere targeting, particularly targeting the leadership of the commission, um, because obviously to extremists the commission represents a threat uh, to, to their activities, um, and because they would know that, that what the commission is going to do is is identify and try and tackle extremist narratives. Um, so, uh, not surprisingly, that's what, what happened. And I think that the response from the Commission was to try and, um, if you like, placate those voices by presenting um, uh, you know, other threats, um, not necessarily, because I should say the criticism and the, the narratives were coming mostly from, from extremist Islamist groups. Um, so they, they tried, I think, to sort of try and um, placate those voices by, by talking and discussing um, uh, in some ways too much, some of the other threats um, that, do, that do exist 
but are not the primary concern or um, the primary threats that the country is currently facing. Thank you, Richard. Um, in your book chapter, you've also um, suggested that there was a need for more emphasis on root causes, what you've termed root causes, such as tackling proponents of what you called warped interpretations of Islamic ideology with resources allocated accordingly. Could you elaborate a little bit further on that for us? Well, this is difficult territory, of course, um, and many countries, particularly across Europe, are struggling with this at the moment. Um, but I do think we need to be more forward leaning. Um, I would fa favor some kind of uh, counter extremism charter that organizations and individuals would have to sign before they could be eligible for any form of government funding or financial support. Um, and, you know, that would potentially include mosques and other religious uh, establishments. Um, I would love to see a cross government counter extremism department. Um, currently, all counter extremism is, is, is um, is done in isolated units across different government departments. I'd like to see those brought together to make a more coherent counter extremism strategy and not just pres the preserve of the Home Office. Um, obviously, a Home Office is concerned about threat um, and um, countering terrorism predominantly, um, but many other government departments like the Ministry of Justice, uh, um, and education, etc., cetera, are, are, have also an important part to play in, in counter extremism, you know, and this 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 um, the area, if you like, the nexus between counter, between extremism and, and and terrorism. Excellent, thank you. I mean, on, on the issue of prevent, I mean, we know in the UK this has faced quite significant criticism, hasn't it? Uh, with some suggesting that it's uh, unfairly stigmatised um, Muslim communities, um, and there are indeed those that suggest that the word prevent itself has become quite toxic and that perhaps in some way it needs to be rebranded um, as something else. Uh, what's your assessment of PREVENT to date as it has evolved? Well, PREVENT has been a tremendous success um, and it's saved lives and, um, and prevented terrorist acts. Um, but as I said earlier, extremists naturally don't like it because it threatens their very existence. Uh, makes them feel vulnerable. Um, and the groups that support Islamist ideologies in particular remind me of the groups that used to support communism in the days of the Cold War. They believe that their theology fervently, and we should not be surprised that they reject the prevent strategy in totality and the government's attempts to, to try and um, roll out the prevent strategy across the country. Um, but we should take comfort, I think, that the vast majority of British Muslims, for instance, do not support Islamist theology and jihadist violence and therefore are not threatened by prevent at all. In fact, um, research has shown that the vast majority of Muslims, uh, when it, the prevent strategy is explained to them, uh, fully support it. Um, and prevent is, is basically a good, it is, is a good thing, it is, it is for all of us uh, to look out for signs that someone close to us has become radicalized in, in any, any form by any kind of uh, extremist narratives, and maybe considering carrying out a terrorist act of some kind. And so it's a government policy that is literally, in my view, saving lives. Um, let me give you a, a small example of this. When I was the head of counterterrorism, I had a phone call uh, that arrived in my office, and I'm not quite sure how it got to me, if you like, but it was actually a, a, it was a, a Muslim father who, who got through to me. And um, he said, look, I want you to deal with my son. And I said, what's happening with your son? And he said, um, well, he said, um, my 15 year old son's got into uh, a really bad, um, he's been radicalized, he's got into a really bad group of people, and I'm very concerned about what he's planning, what he's going to be doing. And I want you to come and, to come and um, speak to him. Um, anyway, we, we, we actually went around to the address, we spoke to the son, we ended up uh, finding a gun under the son's um, uh, bed. And it was clear that this son was planning uh, a terrorist attack. Now, we, he was arrested, he was charged, he was convicted um, of a terrorist offence. And the father actually thanked us for intervening in that case. Um, and he said because he would, would rather his son, you know, served a couple of years prison, in prison than his, 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 you know, his son go off and commit terrorist attacks, which would have killed others, either here or overseas. Now, that's an example of, if you like, preventing action. A father recognising that he needs to do something and ringing somebody up. And what the prevent strategy is, is really providing a mechanism for people to do that. And what, that might be some, uh, a mother that's got a son that's into far right 
uh, extremism, or it might be a Muslim mother that's, that has a, a son that's been radicalized in the mosque. It, it could be any number of ways that someone uh, has become radicalized. Um, but all the prevent strategy do, is, does is provide a mechanism for people to, uh, to, to know who to contact and for something to get done so that terrorism can actually be prevented and lives can be saved. That's very interesting, Richard. Thank you very much. And thanks for sharing that uh, very powerful example with us there. Looking at that prevent strategy then, and based on past experience, as it moves forward, what do you think are the sort of key things that prevent needs to avoid if it's to be successful? Well, the prevent review by uh, William Shawcross that was commissioned by the government is, is ongoing. Um, so we'll see what recommendations uh, that review comes up with. Um, but I do think, um, I, and I'm a strong advocate of strength, uh, uh, of prevent. Um, the strengths of it, I think, are, are obvious. Um, and I think the vast majority of ordinary people support it. Um, so I think we should be careful about apologizing for, for it. We should be careful about saying it's a toxic brand. Because what we're doing, I think, when we say those things is we're giving in, if you like, to the small band of extremist organizations who are in, uh, implacably opposed to it um, because it's a threat to their very existence. Um, so it need, we need to talk about it with confidence and we need to broadcast its successes with confidence and we need to be more bold about its, its um, success and why it's a basically a very, very good thing. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, Returning to your chapter in, in, in our volume, um, and this is the final question, um, you question the resilience of some UK Muslim communities in countering extremism. I wonder if you could also elaborate a little bit further on this and perhaps how this might be addressed. Well, this is a difficult area, of course. Um, and, but one of the difficulties is that whenever a Muslim forum is established, it tends to get, uh, in my experience, get infiltrated by extremist voices, um, uh, who often can be the loudest um, voices um, and the most determined people. Um, uh, for instance, I don't believe that the current Muslim Council of Britain represents the vast majority of Muslims in this country. Um, I think there's a fair amount of evidence to, to, to corroborate that. Um, I, would, I think it would be good if we could have a Muslim leader who represented the many Muslim communities in the UK, just like the chief rabbi represents the Jewish community or the Archbishop of Canterbury represents the Christian community. Um, but I think the key uh, to some of this is, and this is what I alluded to in the chapter, is better integration of our Muslims, uh, British Muslims, into our communities more broadly. And I think, um, interestingly, the, the, the levelling up agenda of the government might help to achieve some of this as the some of the pockets of the UK that lack integration the most uh, are in the northwest of the country where the levelling up agenda will hopefully occur. Um, I would also like to see more emphasis on citizenship um, across the country, more emphasis on patriotism, and I'd like to see Muslims more proud of being British, um, and education has a big role to play here. So it's a difficult area, and I think, but we think we have to work with the Muslim communities uh, within the within the country, and uh, we have to get them to come up with solutions to, and not have the solutions imposed on them. Richard, uh, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us today to share your thoughts and your expertise as well. Thank you very much again. Thank you.